Bill Dolby is the president of Archaeology Southwest and the CEO of Desert Archaeology Incorporated and has been a long time, right? Good. Good. All right, okay. <laughs> and has been a long time collaborator with the School of Anthropology, so I'm very pleased to be the one who gets to introduce it. Thank you. Can you hear me in the back? time here. Um, this is the Archaeology Southwest uh, partnership with the School of Anthropology in do a preservation archaeology field school in the Mule Creek area. And I'm going to try and answer just some of those basic uh, questions like a reporter asks, why, where, when, who, why again, um, and what. So we'll jump right into things. So one of the whys is to promote a concept of preservation archaeology. Uh, I was really affected as a graduate student with the work of, of Bill Light, his point of uh, that we work with a uh, non-renewable resource and we need to take responsibility for the way we do our field work. And at Archaeology Southwest, we have pulled together a concept of preservation archaeology that integrates site protection, uh, researching big questions uh, in ways that uh, use low impact methods and sharing the results of that work to a wide audience. So the uh, part of our mission is to carry that information to the profession and to the next generation of archaeologists. So a field school was an ideal uh, setting to do that. So where is Mule Creek? Uh, you can see <coughs> Here, the other field school uh, locations that have been talked about today. Uh, Mule, Mule Creek is just off into western uh, New Mexico, so it expands the reach of uh, U of A field schools over into the area of New Mexico. And the WAN. We actually began our field work back in, in 2008, and that was a partnership with Hendricks College from Arkansas. Uh, Brett Hill, who was a former employee of, of uh, Archaeology Southwest, came back with some of his students and worked those first two years, and then we had a small uh, season in, in 2010 where a number of volunteers from Hendricks College came back as well. So that started the field school off, and it was in 2011 that we started the partnership with the University of Arizona. Uh, so about 11 students each of those uh, initial three years. And in, in 2014, we had a successful research experience for our graduates, uh, NSF grant that allowed us to expand the field school even uh, more. So that, interestingly, is the exact same number as the uh, Amalavi, uh, excuse me, the uh, Rock Art Ranch. 74 students have, have gone through our program there. And here's where they're from. So they fair number of them have come from Arizona, but uh, they're literally from all across the nation. It's always been struck by the diversity of the uh, population that we, we brought into the, to the field school there at uh, Mule Creek. And those are obviously uh, male-female uh, indications as well. So this is the group from this past spring. We start the process off here in Tucson. Everybody comes here. We have a little bit of time in the, in the office, but right away try to get them out on the ground. So we take them down to a really good example of a preservation archaeology um, uh, site here in Tucson, the Valencia site at Hulk on Ball Court on the south side of town, which has been preserved by uh, Pima County bond funds. Folk deaths on the funds. <laughs> you, could, you could have said that, Sue. <laughs> it's coming up soon. Uh, and they've done a lot of good things for archaeology here in, in the, the uh, Tucson Basin. But uh, after San, uh, the uh, Valencia site, there we take a uh, back uh, of the scenes, uh, or behind, behind the scenes, a uh, tour of the San Javier mission. This is up in the choir loft. And we then load up in the vehicles and 
run up to the cultural center at uh, Tapawa, and people get to have lunch with the staff there and uh, get an insight into how the autumn heritage is um, cared for and cared about there at the uh, in that location. Then they're, they're the very next day they head off to Mule Creek. So back to the why number two. What is the what are the what's the research uh, interest? Uh, the work at, at uh, Archaeology Southwest for more than well over a decade, probably the last 15 years, has has looked at issues related to migration and the Cayenta movement in the late 1200s down into the southern southwest and how that spurs the development of Salado ideology. So that has been a long-term research issue. Um, there's some nice um, markers on the landscape, architectural, uh, there's Maverick Mountain, um, the ceramics that Patrick talked about earlier. I had to put a nice big perforated plate. Uh, that's one of the, the uh, sort of strong uh, markers across the landscape to mark these uh, Cayenta populations across the what southern southwest. Star? I've got a picture in just a minute. <laughs> um, and the other thing that we've got to offer the students is a um, <coughs> compilation of information in readily um, accessible form in issues of our Archaeology Southwest magazine. Uh, working with Jeff Dean on a before uh, the Great Migration, so what were the Cayenta like in the north, and then a, uh, another issue focused on the southern southwest and the implications of, of that uh, movement into the southern southwest. And so we can actually put it all together in this uh, artist's uh, view of uh, sitting in the shade of an adobe structure, so the woman on the right there is using a perforated plate as a mold uh, or a base for uh, forming a, a ceramic vessel. And you can see some of the, the polychrome pottery there, and that's actually set in the uh, context of the Mule Creek in terms of the photographic background there. So uh, just all together in a picture created by Rob Chaccio, um, as of archaeology's uh, artist. So, again, lots of information to work from. The, the compilation uh, over the course of multiple National Science Foundation grants and, and other work, um, collaborative work with uh, the School of Anthropology and the Southwest Social Networks uh, Project as well. Uh, one of the things that, that caused us to go to the Mule Creek area initially is you, you can see in the Mule Creek area the gray spot, the obsidian that is um, found up in that area. Our work along the San Pedro illustrated that tons of um, obsidian was being brought into the San Pedro area during the post uh, 1300 time frame, and the majority of that was coming a from the the. Uh, Neal Creek source, and it was appeared to be controlled by uh, migrants in the San Pedro Valley. So going up to the uh, Neal Creek area where the source is located to see are there um, migrant signatures on that landscape. So uh, just a, so it's that little rectangular uh, yellow area is a study area for an NSF study, the, our up, upper Gila um, and numerous study area. This is a, a close-up of that. You can see the Mule Creek obsidian source and our initial work there, this is with Hendricks College, was done at the Three Up site. And it's kind of in the mid-ground uh, here in this and right in there. You can see the, the whole uh, valley there. It's a lovely uh, area and closing in on the, the site location. The <clears throat> large uh, mound in the, in the background is, is the sort of the central portion of the site, but the locus in the foreground uh, was, had a signature of Maverick Mountain ceramics. Uh, we did recover a uh, perforated plate on the floor of one of the test units into a, a room floor there. So the evidence for a migrant uh, or 
uh, enclave or kind of enclave in that area does seem to be supported by the work that was done at the three up site. And I'm going to move to um, carry the rest of the talk to a, a single site that um, the Dinwiddie site. Jack and Vera Mills did Salado archaeology all over southern Arizona and into New Mexico. And one of the sites, uh, Patrick did some remarkable uh, typological work with their collections that are at the Eastern Arizona College. But when we tried to track down, well, where are the rest of the excavation or artifacts from their excavations, uh, literally all that, that, that's preserved of that is the whole pots, the, the impressive artifacts, uh, the, the standard sorts of things that archaeologists would be interested in, pottery shirts, the, the uh, lithic materials, the ground stone, is no longer to be found, nor are the field notes. So, uh, all we're left with um, is the Dinwiddie site, so we're, we've moved on to the southeast. Duck Creek is a, a tributary to the Gila River. Uh, there's a, the other uh, sites there in the, at the junction of Duck Creek with the, the Gila. <clears throat> are other sites that have these late uh, ceramics on them. But our focus over a course of three years was at the Dinwiddie site. And so what the Mills left us was a about a 70 page report uh, which kind of hits on every one of the rooms, a, a very short uh, summary and uh, ceramic tallies, but again those ceramics are no longer uh, around to um, bring into the, to the modern uh, typology and so on. And this map of the almost 30 rooms that they, they excavated. Fortunately, uh, this was a privately owned property and the owner, Chuck Dinwiddie, uh, was very agreeable in letting us uh, work on the site. And we were able to tie that map onto uh, the landscape after mapping uh, the ground surface. And uh, we initially tried to use the very low impact methods that we would used on the San Pedro Valley of just using one meter by two meter units and that's, you can see those sort of scattered around the periphery uh, of the area. Uh, but the, the amount of trash that we could get through that, they were very shallow deposits, and that, that just did not work as, a, as an approach to the site. So we moved to um, working in some of the room spaces there, going back. So room block two is the northern one, and this is the Aragon. I was the leader up there and we opened up some of the rooms that uh, the mills had said well it was too potted and we didn't really excavate it. it turned out to be a very productive room um, and the that idea that re-excavating places that have been uh, excavated before that uh, has been mentioned by Susie uh, was very productive in in our case as well but uh, the other areas, uh, room block three on the south, you can see that's actually partly in the road bed there. And so looking in the road cut, a very um, well-preserved and it looked like a, at least a three to four foot high adobe wall was showing up in the, in the road cut there. So we opened up um, behind the road cut and you can see, yes, that, that's almost at floor level and uh, it was about a four foot um, preserved wall and floor in, in that room. And the old Patrick guy seen smile. <laughs> Another perforated plate uh, recovered in there. Um, a little bit more detail on that, that uh, room block three, looking how the, the, what was in the road only required that uh, technique that uh, particularly contract archaeologists have, have uh, perfected of getting the leaf blower out and blowing off the, the dust and adobe in particular shows up really well but you can see a lot of the detail of the architecture there, little uh, stone uprights on, on either side of the adobe walls there, uh, the square hearth in the, in the center of the, the room and that hearth matched pretty much the type of hearth that was found in one of the other excavated rooms there as well. So very limited work um, with rooms and, and blowers uh, was very productive um, 
very low impact. Uh, and the final area that was working out there, room black one, was just this past summer. You can see that two, two of the room spaces there were worked in. And again, not as deep as the adobe rooms preserved elsewhere, but nice adobe walls. And then again, there were actually multiple floor levels on, on this uh, structure. So just an overview of what has been possible to do uh, in, in a course of three years at the Dinwiddie site. What appeared to be initially maybe a, about 30 rooms is probably pushing closer to 40 in the, the uh, main room block there, uh, room block two. And each of those other room blocks is probably um, close to another 20 rooms. And to the south, we did some exploration up on the hilltop there. Could not find architecture, but some of the most um, disturbed, hot-hunted um, site area that uh, you could imagine. But the ceramics would suggest that there could have been yet another um, contemporaneous room block up on top of the hill. So we've brought that site where we just had a few whole pots in a museum collection uh, into a setting where we have a much better idea of what the whole settlement is like. We have now samples that will be, uh, we're just starting now to do the analyses on those. And uh, so there will be flotation, uh, pollen, uh, faunal, the kinds of, of uh, data that uh, Dr. Longacre, Uncle Willie, was uh, <laughs> starting back in the, in the day. Uh, up at Black Grasshopper. So um, bringing that old and tantalizing work by the avocationals, the mills, into a um, modern context. And we also did our best to share this information with the local community, open houses, um, sharing with the folks at the, the local library. And we've gone back um, with uh, other outreach events uh, after the, the field work was over. So one of the other really successful things in terms of working with the students was this hands-on while they're working. Adobe architecture as a new, um, to, to uh, using a trowel um, is tough to work in. So we actually created uh, with Ellen uh, DeNoyer as the supervisor our own Adobe Pueblo room back at the camp and this is the foundations being made in the first year it actually took two years to get through this project students working on making that so they're back and forth between work in the field and work um, making their own and getting the insights into how it looks how it dries how it uh, feels and so on and this last the end of the last field season, uh, the room is largely complete. The, the roof never got fully completed, but uh, students atop the uh, room there at the end of the field season. And I just want to run real quickly through uh, our staff. And one of the <coughs> other themes of the hands-on effort was to uh, make their own atlatls, and we did a lot of throwing of atlatls. So. Uh, let me run through our staff here. <laughs> On the left is uh, our project uh, director, Karen Schollmeyer, uh, Leslie Aragon on the right. <clears throat> Stacy Ryan uh, was, is now a, a student here, but she was a, a, uh, one of our field supervisors. And uh, Barry Price Steinbrecher was, is on the right there. This is the dress up at the last day party. So, uh, and it was also right after the students attacked us all with water balloons. So, uh, and then uh, Will Russell from ASU, and then the poor deer, the, the brunt of all of the uh, work with the LL Thompson. So, and again, just the final. Again, these are all their homemade atlatls that they seasoned up on top of the, of the room they reconstructed. So, uh, again, that's the 
story of the Preservation Archaeology Field School debate, our goal is to get a renewal on the research experience for undergraduates and to go back and there's still a couple more, um, at least one more uh, site there in the valley that uh, we would target uh, this coming year and the year after. So anyway, thank you so much. Bill, and thanks to all of our presenters. Um, I will say it's really tough to keep people on time, and while we're a little bit over, I have to say, given the number of people we have presenting and the information that we learned today, I just want to thank all of you for coming. It, any one of these individuals could have given us an entire day's worth of information, and so we thank, thank, thank you for being here. And I was going to comment on um, Barney having come from the farthest distance. However, I just want to point out that Barbara Mills actually flew in from Paris last night to be here with us. So she wins um, in that particular respect. And I think that says a lot about the dedication and commitment of our field school directors to be here and be at this event. It really is a, a special time. And uh, before I go any further, I do want to also thank the U of A Press has been out in the hall and has, are, are a tremendous partner to the School of Anthropology, actually evolved out, came out of the, the Department of Anthropology years ago. Um, but they have agreed to reprint all of the anthropological papers. So if you hadn't gotten that word yet, um, you have that word now. And so there's all kinds of good additional information that you can get uh, beyond what we learned today. I also want to just make a comment. Truly, I think we could argue that this was engaging, innovating, and partnering in our field schools. And that that has been happening for a very long time. As a matter of fact, I'd go so far to say that the U of A archaeological field schools never settle. Um, so <laughs> with that, Speaking of engaging, innovating, and partnering, we're going to shift gears a little bit now to recognize a very special partner and to um, talk a little bit about an award that was created in this, the Department of Anthropology, and it is the Raymond H. Thompson Award. This was initiated at the University of Arizona Department of Anthropology, now the School of Anthropology, just as part of the 90th anniversary um, celebration gala event to honor our third department head, uh, Raymond Thompson. It recognizes Ray's long-standing contributions to the development of anthropology as a discipline at the University of Arizona and beyond. The award is given to anthropologists to recognize their unique contributions <coughs> to the discipline of anthropology and to our school. The presentation of the first award was made to Arthur Jelinek, who is here with us, for his contributions to the archaeology of the Middle Paleo Paleolithic in Western Eurasia and the Membrous Phenomenon of New Mexico. There are currently six re recipients of the Raymond Thompson Award, several who are here with us this afternoon. Arthur Jelinek, Jane Hill, Stephen Zagura, Carol Gifford, Jeff Reed, and William Longacre. Now, William hasn't received his medal yet. He is going to be honored at our December Centennial Gala Dinner, and I hope we will see all of you there to be there. But the, we had the opportunity when this uh, semester's um, nomination committee presented nominations and reviewed to honor somebody and said, there was really no better place than right here at this event to do that. So I'd like to turn the microphone over to one of the members of that nominating committee to talk a little bit about this year's recipient. Thank you. So when the nominating uh, announcement came out, uh, my colleagues and I couldn't think of a better person uh, to uh, suggest uh, in anyone else but um, Bill Doley. So I'm going to read you a little bit of the nominating letter, not the whole thing, but a little bit of it. Um, Bill received his PhD from the school, then Department of Anthropology, in 1980 and is one of our most distinguished alumni. 
Uh, he is the president and CEO of Archaeology Southwest, Inc., and the Center for Desert Archaeology, both based in Tucson, whichever way that goes. <laughs> Throughout Bill's 30-plus years as a professional archaeologist, he has fostered strong relationships with the school, sponsors a student reception each fall to encourage interaction between the school and Archaeology Southwest and the rest of the Tucson community, supports internships and fellowships for students, and more recently provides field training for our students, continuing this highly respected tradition of the University of Arizona's anthropology program, as you just heard. In addition, he has mentored and hired many of anthropology's graduates, twice served as a member of our academic program review committee, and is a frequent speaker in our classes and other school programs. Beyond the above interactions and support for the school, Bill Doley is one of the most well-respected archaeologists working in the greater Southwest. His company, Desert Archaeology, Inc., sets the bar for outstanding work in cultural resources management. The projects that they have worked on, such as in the Tonto and Tucson basins, are models for meticulous and timely reporting. The excavations, analysis, and publication of projects in the Santa Cruz corridor, such as at Las Capas, have revolutionized our knowledge of the early agricultural period. Bill's direction of Archaeology Southwest is similarly a model for nonprofits in the Southwest. His work on preservation archaeology has protected countless archaeological and historical resources, promoted an ethic of research that minimally impact, impact sites, and engaged many students and community members in the excitement of Southwest archaeology. The magazine Southwest Archae uh, South Archaeology Southwest presents topical research in a lively and accessible format that is read widely and used in a variety of University of Arizona anthropology classes. The multi-year preservation fellowships supported by Archaeology Southwest have benefited, benefited several of our PhD students, allowing them to complete their data collection and writing. In addition, Bill has overseen the collaborations between the school and his staff in multiple NSF grants, including the NSF REU for the Mule Creek Field School. Bill has done all of this, um, as well as serving in multiple service roles to our professional organization, something that was uh, a model established by Professor Thompson, including the Society for American Archaeology and the American Anthropological Association. In addition, he has maintained a research and writing program of his own that has resulted in multiple publications about Southwest archaeology and preservation archaeology more generally. We consider Bill to be an especially deserving awardee one that symbolizes the broader community, regional, and national outreach so well exemplified by the service of Raymond H. Thompson. And now, Dr. Thompson himself will say some words. Thank you. If we were running a little late, you could have skipped all of that stuff. You know, uh, unless you have spent uh, a lengthy sojourn in Lower Slobovia, you already knew all of the wonderful accomplishments of Bill Doyle. I uh, am <clears throat> not going to say very much. I just want to share with you a historical document about some important happenings in archaeology. And it's entitled, When God Forgot Archaeology. <laughs> Way back at the beginning of time, in 4004 BC, God was busy with matters sublime, and he forgot to include archaeology. <laughs> Distraught about this oversight, he tried to find a simple way to get the record right and archaeology on its way. But when he had finished with creation, he had promised not to intervene, even though the global situation resembled a real disaster scene. So he relaxed and hoped for progress, and soon was pleased to see the wealth they used the fruit of their success to acquire the treasures of antiquity. They traveled widely in exotic climes. They made the past as trendy as Chianti. They discovered tombs from antique times. They were archaeological dilettanti. <laughs> they found that ancient sites were everywhere and under threat of desecration. Discovered, <laughs> and they badgered Congress to declare a national code of preservation. Well, to protect 
famous buildings must be saved forever in historic preservation strategy. In archaeological preservation, however, Congress chose, with unforeseen sagacity, to protect sites not by preserving them forever, but by saving all the clues inherent in the objects buried in them. Site preservation means save their residues. Archaeologists were soon in great demand, so universities began to train a few. But God, however, took the stand that what was needed was a slew. So when he received a few complaints about his newly acquired Latter-day Saints, he rescued Byron Cummings from Salt Lake City and sent him to Tucson to teach in quantity the needed archaeologists at the U of A, where he had been beatified as the dean, and also to prepare for the 100-year holiday of Anthro in 2015. <coughs> in Arizona, rampant growth was in full sway. Dams and factories, roads and shopping malls, military bases, plus serve river and fall, with archaeological sites quite often in the way. But Congress had wisely decreed that it does not harm a bit once the site's secrets have been retrieved to build a road on top of it. Salvage archaeology of limited scope allowed professors and their students to rescue from each site its contents, but it was hard for them to cope with the rapid growth of this activity. Sorely needed was a better strategy. Privatization, said the business community, would be appropriate for archaeology. Americans, egged on by political hacks, were privatizing education and penology as they were getting government off their backs. Why not try it out on archaeology? But there were legal obstacles to change. So it was time for ASM's director, following Harper's lead, to arrange for a move to the private sector. Once the change was put in place, scholars combined their old school acumen together with the skills of commerce and invented the world of CRM. No longer the exclusive territory of academics, archaeology is now a market economy, fully mainstream within the community. God rejoiced in CRM lit, once called gray, but now robust, and a most important conduit for solid evidence one can trust. Although God derived great satisfaction that archaeology survived its botched creation, he picked up a worrisome indication of a coming crisis in CRM curation. The SAA has shown how well a CRM press can run the national team. While CRM may once have been an infidel, it's now in archaeology's mainstream. Those CRM moguls carried out God's plan, served the nation, expanded research, created jobs. Some, like Bill Doyley, did so with Elan, while coping with still present anti-CRM snobs. Bill has increased the Southwest as a whole and colonized in all locales and climes. The epic saga of the region is his goal. He is the Harold Gladwin of our time. historical summary will give you some idea of how, how much I respect Bill and how envious I am of the wonderful empire that he has built. <laughs> Hopefully that doesn't scare you too much that I put on the clip. <laughs> Barbara had a two-pager, Ray had three, I got four. <laughs> However, they're really short. I do need to say thank you to Barbara and to, to Ray uh, and to the committee in, in general. 
uh, to start things off, but there's a couple of other folks that I absolutely want to thank uh, here to start with. This is a deeply humbling and, and very pride-inducing moment and to get dog roll from Ray. Uh, <laughs> but let me start with a thanks to Linda Mayro. We were married 40 years ago on Wednesday of this week. We celebrated our 40th. Um, she's an amazing professional archaeologist in her own right, and she's the love of my life, and she's thankfully tolerant of someone who sometimes works too much. <laughs> um, quickly, the staff, all of the staff at Desert Archaeology and Archaeology Southwest, I mean, they're the ones that do the, the real work, um, and in particular, and the Pierce, who's in the back, Trish Castelia, who uh, works at Desert Archaeology. Without those uh, administrative assistants uh, that are all the time you know, getting the work done, uh, we would never accomplish what we uh, accomplish. Particular shout out to Henry Wallace, who really introduced me to the San Pedro Valley um, and who started to do the refinements of the chronology and, and some of those base, basic works in the very first work that, that we did in the Tucson Basin. And finally, to all the mentors and, and collaborators uh, here over the years at the Arizona State Museum, uh, the, the department, the school, uh, in particular Barbara Bills for the collaboration on multiple national science funds. Uh, foundation grants and Patrick Lyons for the collaboration um, that he has been involved with uh, since the early 2000s. So I've got an announcement to make. Some folks may already be um, tuned in, but one of the ways in which I have some emulation of uh, Ray Thompson's career is the wearing of two hats. <laughs> Ray was, uh, ran both the uh, Department of, of Anthropology and the Arizona State Museum. I've had the hat for Desert Archaeology Incorporated and the hat for uh, now Archaeology Southwest. And finding a successor, uh, that succession process is a difficult one. And the uh, what I'd like to everyone here to know today is that Desert Archaeology is going to have a successor. Um, she's in the room, and she's been mentioned many times already today, Barbara Mills in particular. But Sarah Herr is, um, we're in the process of looking at her becoming the owner of the organization. Uh, the, her um, broad skills, her uh, hard work, her uh, sharing a lot of common ground with me is something that really makes it a comfortable transition and we're going to work together over the next little over two years as I sort of uh, wind my work down at Desert Archaeology and desert, the new Desert Archaeology becomes a woman-owned business run by Sarah Hurst. And as I spend um, more time at Archaeology Southwest, there will come a day when there needs to be a transition there, and I expect that that will be a process of uh, going up for a national search to, uh, as I step down there. So we're to pages three and four. <laughs> this is the 24-7 Ig Nobel Prize winning formula for treating academics. So it's 24 seven, two parts, 24 seconds. In 1972, I came to Tucson, the world capital of professional archeology. span I learned to work harder than ever before. I found new opportunities in CRM. I contributed to my community and my profession through for-profit Desert Archaeology, Inc. A nonprofit context was through Archaeology Southwest accomplished even more. Networks derived from U of A were invaluable and are still. I'm not done yet. <laughs> Part two, seven. 
seven words. Multiple milestones accomplished, many to go. Thanks. <laughs>